All right. There I am. I hear the kickback. You guys good? God is good, amen? Amen. It's good to, good to be here. I love seeing you guys. Love this. I love this. Gathering together. Being, a, being as one. One service. Being together. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Aren't you loving this book? I'm not the only one, right? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I think that's what we need right now. To focus solely on our Savior. You know, today we're going to be looking at the final verses of chapter 2, which will include verses 16 through 23. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. The last couple of weeks, we have been following up on that amazing truth that was found in verse 10, that we are complete in Christ. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. Thank you, Lord. You know, we as Christians, we are not complete in any earthly relationship, no career move, no political agenda or worldly philosophy. Our completeness comes in having a personal relationship with the most powerful, loving, magnificent person in the history of the world, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He alone completes us. Let's never forget that but remind ourselves and others that Jesus and he alone satisfies, he alone strengthens, he alone com- completes us. Amen? I want a lot of amens today. <laughs> you know, if we put anything in front of him, we will find ourselves in danger. We will miss our purpose. We will start drifting off access in our faith. And that's when discouragement comes. That's when the minor things in life become the major things. And that's when we will miss the heart and plan of God for this world and our personal lives. You know, Ephesians chapter three, verse 17, it talks about the necessity of Jesus dwelling in our hearts, him being the number one priority. One translation says it like this, Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. You know, Jesus is to take up residency. He is to be at home there in our hearts. The number one thing in our hearts. You know, I am not a homebody necessarily, but I love my home. (laughs) My home is so comfortable for me. It might not be that comfortable for you, but for me, it's my haven. You know, when I go to someone else's home, it's not the same. I don't know if you could testify with me, but at someone else's house, you cannot relax like you can at your house. You don't know where anything is. You look at a drawer and you're like, why do they put the utensils in that drawer? This decor? Really? That picture? No way. I'm not going to judge you if I go to your house, just, just so you know. But most of you would agree there's nothing like being at your own home because it's yours. At your home, you can throw on your mismatched pajamas, you can open the cupboards and find your guilty pleasure snacks, Oreo cookies, beef jerky sticks, pork rinds, whatever you like. You can plop down on the couch Turn on Netflix or Disney Plus and find your watch list ready for you to go. Home is where we can settle in and be at complete peace. My family and I just went camping during the week. And let me just say that taking three kids out camping where there's no warm showers, no memory foam mattresses, no cell phone reception, no AC in 100 plus weather at eight o'clock at night, Let me say, it's not the most comfortable experience for extreme city folks like the Beck family. (laughs) But I also noticed something else when I was out there. When I was out camping, there were a lot of dangers I needed to warn my kids about. I caught myself saying, yelling, kids, be careful. Don't get too close to that open fire. You can get burned. The water current is too strong. Stay close to us. The sun is blazing hot. Put some sunblock on and reapply. That was mainly for me, that one. (laughs) Do not wander off alone. There are wild animals and bugs out there. There's bears, snakes, even scorpions have been seen at this location. I thought, why on earth do people like to go camping? (laughs) We realize we we are fragile LA people. Let me just say, our next camping trip will be a hotel room. with a thermostat and a pool. But I do like camping, just not every vacation. But my point is when we arrived home, we we returned to our comfort. We were at our peaceful little haven. It's the place that we found our rest. 
The same is true in our Christian lives. Christ is to be where our home is. In Jesus, we are safe. In Jesus, we are strong spiritually. And this is why the Bible instructs us to stay close to him and center our lives on him. This is why the Bible warns us to look out for dangers and be on guard from things that can negatively influence our lives and pull us away from Jesus. Because in this world, like when camping, there is a risk of getting bit up. There's a risk of getting burned, lost, and harmed spiritually. If we allow anything to take us away from that safe place where Christ is ruling in our hearts, we are in great danger. And today in our passage, Paul gives us three warnings that can endanger the Christian life. Three things that we should look out for as Christians. And number one is legalism. Number two is false spirituality. And number three is self-imposed religion. Legalism, false spirituality, and self-imposed religion. So let's pray and then we will go down our verses and look at each danger one at a time. So Lord God, we do thank you for today. We thank you for the work that you're doing in each one of our hearts. I pray that our Lord would be at home in our hearts and that we would be at rest in you, not looking to anything else but Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you. Open up your word to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 16 and 17, Paul writes, so let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. The first warning that Paul brings up is a warning against legalism. Legalism can simply be thought of as Jesus and, a Jesus and mentality. That instead of simply receiving and believing in Jesus' death and resting in his finished work upon the cross, there needs to be some sort of human effort and working that makes you right with God. That Jesus is not enough to save, but your own goodness and effort needs to be the emphasis. Well, right off the bat, let's be reminded this morning that Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 is the truth for us Christians. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Our goodness, our great works, our human effort, no matter how hard we try, will never be enough for us to be accepted by God. Only grace, only God's goodness, and through faith, believing in Jesus' perfect sacrifice on the cross, will we be saved. And so Paul says, don't let anyone tell you different or add anything to the cross of Jesus Christ, who alone saves you. He says, don't let anyone judge you which means don't let anyone condemn you or add any unnecessary burdens to you. And specifically here at this church, there were false teachers who were coming in and saying, in order to please God, you need to believe in Jesus and. You need to believe in Jesus and eat certain foods. You need to believe in Jesus and keep certain days. They were adding to to Christ diet and days. And I do think we see that around today. Regarding foods, I have heard things like, Christians should only eat this way. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit and you are putting that in your body. You know Adam and Eve, they didn't eat animals. And that's when things were perfect. So that means you shouldn't eat it either. If that is your conviction, if that's what you wanna eat, only vegetables, more power to you but it's not mine. (laughs) For me, I'm eating meat. I love meat and I will continue to eat meat. You know, while I was camping, one of the highlights was tri-tip that was cooked on an open fire. And just the smell of that makes you drool. Just thinking about that, again, makes me drool. I had bacon every morning. (laughs) And I'm sorry, no Beyond Meat product or Impossible Veggie Patty can satisfy like the real thing. I love meat, but an even greater reason than the wonderful physical satisfaction that I get by consuming meat is the biblical support and the freedom that we have. In the Old Testament, God did give the children of Israel specific laws regarding what to eat and what not to eat. 
And if you study what God prescribed for them, there were some very beneficial health reasons to the clean eating he commanded them to follow. But we have to point out that this was commanded specifically to Israel in the Old Testament. It was intended for them. And these dietary laws are not emphasized in the New Testament. In fact, the, the opposite is seen in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 10, Peter gets a vision during a time of prayer. And in that vision, he sees all these unclean animals coming down. And a voice calls to him and says to Peter, kill and eat. But Peter responded, Lord, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And to that voice, to that the voice said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And to that, me and many of you shout out, thank you, Jesus. And I think Peter did too the first time he ate pork. Now we are allowed to pig out as Christians. <laughs> amen, hallelujah. Give me another amen for that one. You know, Jesus himself declared all foods clean in Mark chapter seven by saying, defiles them, but what comes out of the heart? And he lists some of those things that are produced from the heart. Things like evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. This is what we are to look out for and emphasize. The things of the heart, not what we eat. Which means if after service this morning you want to indulge in an in and out double-double with that yummy smothered cheese, animal fries, and then stop by Randy's Donuts for a luscious apple fritter afterwards, don't let anybody judge you. <laughs> so just, just, just say praise the Lord. And hey, in and out has Bible verses on the containers, so it's actually spiritual to go to in and out But in all seriousness, eating certain foods or refraining from certain foods does not make us any holier. Sure, eating well-balanced foods is a good idea for a long, healthy life, but it does not make us closer to God. The same is true with days. He says, let no one judge you regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. Again, for the Jews in the Old Testament, there were festivals which refer to the yearly feasts Israel would celebrate. New moons would, would be their monthly celebrations. And then there was the weekly observance of the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is Saturday. And the Jews were commanded in the law to keep it and set that day apart to the Lord. But like the, with the dietary laws, the keeping of the Sabbath was a sign to Israel. And the New Testament does not emphasize the keeping of the Sabbath for the Christian. The New Testament does, does have a lot of instruction about putting God first in our lives, but nowhere are we told that we better observe the Sabbath day in order to have a right standing with God. But we are free to worship God on any day, and I would say every day. In Romans 14, verse five, Paul says, one person considers one day more sacred than the other. Another consi considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. But even though we do not hold to the Sabbath day, I believe as Christians, we need to watch out. We need to be on, on guard when, how we view Sunday mornings because we can become legalistic in the way that we view what we're doing here today. Now, don't get me wrong. Sundays are important. The assembling together is an essential part of our faith. And I absolutely love what we do here. I, I love being out here. I love seeing you guys. I love spending this time worshiping. It, it's, it's huge for our faith. And in scripture, Sundays are known as the Lord's Day. And traditionally, we emphasize this day because it was the day in which Jesus rose from the dead. He rose from the dead on a Sunday. But we need to understand that coming to church or participating in any of our other spiritual practices, for that matter, is not what makes us right with God. They are a huge part of the Christian life, but they do not make us Christians. What makes us a Christian is believing in Jesus and what he has done for us. That's what makes us right with God. Remember, legalism is Jesus and. So we could in error conclude, I believe in Jesus and. I came to church 52 Sundays in a row. Now I'm good with God. Jesus and I read my Bible every morning at 6 a.m. So I'm good. Jesus and I prayed for this long. Jesus and I don't eat that food. Jesus and I listen to only this music. Jesus and I only watch these movies. Jesus and I don't watch any TV at all. 
I am right with God because Jesus and these spiritual disciplines. I mean, how many of us get stuck in that way of thinking? Now, conviction is good. God changing our desires to help our practical walk is a benefit for our spiritual lives. Will doing these things enhance our lives, keep us focused and walking strong in Jesus? Absolutely, absolutely. But these spiritual disciplines do not make us right with God. We do these things because we are saved, not to save us. We are right with God by Christ and Christ alone. It can never be Jesus and something. It, could be never, it can never be Jesus and anything. It is only Jesus. And notice what verse 17 shows us about the Sabbath and all the Jewish celebrations. It says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. What we see in the Old Testament was a shadow or a picture of Christ, but it is not a complete picture of Christ. The feast the Jews celebrated, the Sabbath that was given for them to, to rest, all pointed to Jesus. He is the fulfillment of all these things. Only in him is there really a reason to celebrate. Is there full rejoicing? Only in him is there complete rest. All that came before was not the substance, but a shadow. A shadow shows that there is something there, but you are not able to fully see it. It shows a slight representation of the physical object casting the shadow. The shadow is not what is important. The substance that is casting the shadow is what is important. Micah, my three-year-old, if you've been in our church for a while, you know that I've talked about him and his obsession with fighting with lightsabers. His obsession with being a Star Wars Jedi. It's all the time. It's all that he wants to do. And for some reason, he always wants to be the bad guy. Pray for us, for mom and dad. And he'll use anything as a lightsaber. He'll use a straw. He will use leaves. He points his finger at me and he goes, let's fight. And now we have to use pool noodles inside our house instead of the plastic lightsabers because he's damaging everything. But one thing I noticed that he was doing, when we battled outside, instead of watching me, he was watching his shadow the whole time. He wanted to see the reflection of what we were doing. I don't know if it made him feel like he was in the movie or what, but he just kept watched, watched the shadow. The problem with that is he didn't know which way I was attacking because he only, saw part, he only saw the shadow. He couldn't see the angles in which I was attacking. And believe me, I had a lot of fun with that. But it makes me think, how many people are doing the same exact thing? They are looking at the shadow instead of the substance. They have Jesus right in front of them. They have the answer to eternal life. They have the answer to a satisfying life, but they are focusing on a shadow. They are missing the substance. The real thing is Christ. Real life, salvation, completeness is found in him. But they are looking at something incomplete. I think about the unbelieving Jews. Unbelieving Jews look at the Old Testament and the law that point to Jesus, but they miss Jesus. Others even today, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, the Bible teaches us. When we look at a beautiful day like this, you can gaze at the sun and you can say, wow, there is a creator out there. But what do people in our world wanna do? They wanna fix the planet and think that that is what it's all about instead of looking to God for their lives. Or when this virus situation is gone, people think, you know, when, when the virus is gone, life will be complete. Things will be good. Life will be satisfying. Before this virus happened, their life was not satisfying because they were without Jesus. It's not gonna change after this virus is gone. When the virus goes away, more things are gonna happen. You know this world's gonna continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse. We need to look to Jesus. We need to look to the one who promises a, a new home where we will forever be changed, where he will rule in true righteousness where all things will be just and complete. We have the real thing in Jesus, in the simplicity and greatness of who he is. You know, there's a lot of different opinions of what's going on right now in, in so many different arenas. And people ask me, they're like, you know, where do you stand on all this? politically and, and all this, all that's taking place with the cultural tensions, with this election year. 
And, and you see some people who are adamant that this is what you need to do. Christians need to do this. Christians need to vote this way. Christians need to stand for this. Where do you stand, Justin? I was talking to someone, and when I stand before the Lord, I just wanna say, Lord, I, I, I taught you. I have my opinions about things. I have my perspective on things that are going on. But like Paul says, I'm gonna preach Christ, and that's what I'm focusing on. That's the main thing. You know, you can think Jesus and this issue, this one specific issue is the biggest issue for Christians. The biggest issue for Christians is Jesus. The big, biggest issue for this world is Jesus. Giving your life to him. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to rescue sinners. Jesus came to save people. And I think we can get blo blocked by things. I think we can look at things politically. We can put politics in front of our relationship with Jesus. And I know this is tough. And this was not in my notes. <laughs> But it's something I believe we need to do because I could talk to every single person in this place today and you all have a different opinion. But you know what? If you believe in Jesus, you have Jesus. And that's what unites us together in him. And that's what we're to focus on. That's what is to be our priority in life. And yes, should Christians vote? Yes, I totally believe that. Should Christians stand for certain things? Yes, but there's a lot. Different, different opinions of what to stand for. And God has called specific people to do those things. But me, at the church, I'm, I'm gonna preach Jesus. That's what I'm centered on. That's what I believe God's word is all about is Jesus. Him crucified for the sins of the world so that he saves, every, every person who believes in him will be saved. That's what I'm focusing on. Amen? It can't be Jesus and anything. It's only Jesus. So number one, Paul warns about legalism. And number two, Paul warns about false spirituality. Look at verse 18. He says, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. As people miss the substance and the reality of life in Christ, we can see that their belief systems are often based solely on counterfeit experiences. Now let me say, there are spiritual experiences in the Christian faith like no other. We know we are, we are not to walk looking for signs or according to our feelings. We're to walk by faith, not by sight. But as children of God, those who are placing their hope and trust in Jesus, we can trust that our God will lead us. He will speak and he will reveal things to us in supernatural ways, laying things upon our heart, directing us in his will. But here in our passage, in addition to those false teachers putting up legalistic trips on the church, there were some who are also trying to emphasize a spiritual experience other than the truth found in God's word. In verse 18, it reveals that instead of worshiping and honoring the true and the living God, they committed idolatry by worshiping angels. They were trying to persuade the believers that joining in this counterfeit worship experience would lead to a deeper spiritual encounter than they had with Jesus. And these false teachers put on this front, this, this outside expression like, we are so humble. We care for you guys so much. We want you to experience this deepness in worship. But in reality, Paul says, these false teachers were vainly puffed up in their fleshly mind. These false teachers loved the attention they were getting as they look, they took people away from Jesus and, and it puffed them up. And their intriguing instruction, it wowed those listeners. It wowed the people. I mean, how many false beliefs or religions are wowing people today with counterfeit experiences? And some sound good. Some sound revolutionary and exciting. You know, I was reading and watching some interviews about one popular New Age spiritual guru who had a lot of intriguing, even captivating things to say. Totally off, but definitely fascinating. And as I watched, I could see how easy it would be for people who are not grounded in God's word to be deceived. Thinking, wow, his views, his ideas are so deep. They are so fresh. Man, I like that. And this guru even brought up Jesus. And that's when I was like, hold on a second. And he started off to discuss Jesus, even pointing out some truths about our Lord. 
But then that quickly switched to presenting Jesus as this new age kind of Jesus. And he explained that Jesus' main purpose was not to save us from our sins and deliver, to deliver us from eternal separation from God, but Jesus' mission was to be a spiritual guide and to be, uh, that, that is to be modeled how we can have divine enlightenment, how we can have this God conscience, consciousness. That's what Jesus came to do. And as, he, as I, I was reading and watching this, these things, I was like, where did you get that? Where in the world does that come from? It does not come from here. That's, this, that's not the Jesus we read about in the Bible. But I could see how people would be like, wow, I never thought about that. I, this is so profound. This is so new. There's a saying that says, if it is new, it is not true. If it is true, it is not new. It is so sad when people give in to this counterfeit spirituality, especially Christians who, who have walked strong in the truth for years, who get deceived and embrace unbiblical ideas. We need to stick with this and what it teaches. You know, when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate there, and he was about to be scourged and crucified for the sins of the world, he did not say, you know, I came to bring consciousness to all people. He said, for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus came to deliver and redeem us, to die in our place, to reconcile man to God. This is what the Bible teaches. This is the truth. And true spirituality is not found in any new age meditation, is not found in any deep philosophical thought or even an intense internal sensation you feel inside. Now that sensation might just be indigestion from the double doubles and greasy fries that you're eating. True spirituality is found in God's objective, perfect word. At the beginning of verse 18, Paul says, let no one cheat you of your reward. Paul does not want them to be cheated or swayed or robbed of their prize, which is the truth that in Jesus is life is satisfaction and is found in him alone. If you are here today, you know this. God's word needs to be the priority in our lives. And that's what Paul is getting at. In verse 19, he says, these false teachers were missing it. He says, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Now there's a lot of worldly wisdom out there. There's a lot of things that sound profound, but true nourishment and spiritual maturity is only found in the head. It is only found in Jesus Christ. And church, we need to continue to focus on Jesus for the answers. We need to be on guard. If someone tries to convince you that life is about anything but a personal relationship with the Jesus of the Bible, we have to disregard it. Come back to what the word teaches because here we will find strength purpose and nourish, nourishment. Amen? So look out for legalism, false spirituality, and lastly, self-imposed religion. Look at verse 20 through 23. He says, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. On the same plane of legalism is the idea in, that in order to be right with God, we have to completely deny ourselves of any comforts or pleasures in our lives. And we might even think, well, Jesus said, he said, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him daily. That speaks of agony. And we, we as Christians were to live under heavy burdens. We are to walk around with the mentality that the Christian life is all about heartache, difficulties, hardships, and sufferings. And this is what God wants for me. He wants me to live in agony. He wants me to walk around with my face looking like it's been sucking on lemons all day. Or Christians are supposed to have the Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh outlook on life. Everything is horrible. I'm supposed to be miserable. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And they, and they believe that misery is a sign of spirituality. You know, this way of thinking 
can help us to understand the mentality of those who add those strange practices of self-imposed affliction to their lives, thinking that it brings them closer to God. You've heard stories of people who do things like physically whipping themselves to inflict pain so they stay disciplined. Go as long as they can without eating or sleeping. Maybe even joining a monastery and taking a vow of silence, not speaking for days or years thinking they are more spiritual because they deny themselves of the comforts of life. That true spirituality is suffering and being as miserable as possible. And when people do these self-denial kinds of actions, it looks spiritual. It looks like a holy thing. We, and we might even look on and think, wow, look at what they are able to do. Look how disciplined they are in their life as they take that vow. But Paul says in verse 22, this mentality is man-made not God made. God is not asking you to make crazy restrictions on yourself, but he wants you to walk in the freedom he has given you in Christ. Verse 23 says it has the appearance of wisdom. It looks like dedication to God. It looks like it is a holy way of living. But in reality, Paul says it is self-imposed religion, false humility, and has no value against the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, it does not work. To try and make yourself spiritual, to discipline yourself is not gonna work. You are going to fall. You can't conquer your flesh that way. The only way you can conquer the flesh is in Christ, is by the power of the Spirit working in your life. We as people can naturally impose religious behavior upon our lives, thinking in order to be right with God, I have to do this and I can't do that. But this is self-imposed religion. It's not God's heart for us. God's heart for us is to walk in newness of life, not in bondage and rules and regulations. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. He wants us to have an overflowing lives, to have lives that are full of joy, to have lives that are full of rest, delighting in the Lord, walking with him every single day. Contrary to what we might think, God does not look down on us and say, I want you to be miserable every day of your life on earth. And that's why you're gonna appreciate heaven because one day things will be good. No, he wants us to experience the fullness of him now. He wants to experience true life in him right now. Yes, heaven will be 100 billion times better than the most wonderful day we've ever had on this planet. But God wants to, uh, us to experience the richness of life that he has for us today. You know, the Christian life does have spiritual attacks. The Christian life does have persecution. The Christian life does have hardships. And trials and sufferings are part of it. But we as Christians are still called to flourish during that time. Walking in that grace, walking in the power of the Spirit. We are called to rejoice and have joy in the Lord, as he encourages, encourages us through it, no matter what we face. And the only way, Christian, you will experience that through this pandemic, through the uncertain days, through the internal struggle that you are facing, through all that you're seeing in this world is to have that real personal relationship with Jesus. We have heard it, and most of us have said this statement. Christianity is not a religion, but a relationship. Who said that? Most of us, two of us, okay, well. (laughs) But how many of us are living it that way? Living the relationship with Jesus, not living the religion, the Jesus and, living the fullness of life that he has for us, walking in the freedom that he wants for us, experiencing that mercy every single morning, the grace that we get to walk in, the love from our God that nothing can separate us from. Verse 20, again, it says, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you add all this stuff to you? You died with Christ. You have new life in him. You are born again. You died with him. You have been gifted everlasting life and a personal relationship with the God of the universe. We as Christians should have the greatest hope on the planet as we wait for eternity. We as Christians should not be frantic about every change that happens in our society, but walk daily in the fullness, freedom, and peace that God supplies. We can be bold when we enter hardships and tribulations because we know everything is Father-filtered. Do you know that? 
Everything come, the Father knows. And think about that now. A lot of times we, we think, oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? What are we gonna do as a church? You don't think God knows? He knows it all. The bat, what do we sing? The battle's his. We get to find our encouragement in him. We get to walk in the strength of Jesus every single day. The power of the spirit, looking to him. What are you looking at? Are we looking at our savior? Are we believing his word for our, our lives? Are we trusting completely in him? Church, he is the answer. This is what we're learning in Colossians. It's all about Jesus. The fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus Christ. And you are complete in him. You are complete in him, amen? Lord, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for a day in the sun. We thank you for a day in the sun. Lord, that we get to truly have life in you. Lord, I pray that it, today, if anyone does not know you, God, that they would come to you. Lord, realize that you are the one who forgives sins. You are the one who, who can make us right. That you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. And we can have not only everlasting life, but eternal life, which is knowing you and you giving that, us that abundant life that we seek right now through trials, through uncertain times, through difficulty. Lord, we have our life in you. Our trust is placed in you. You are a good God. And what is amazing, Lord, is you have united us together in you. And I pray that we would be what you've called us to be as a church. Lord, that we would love one another as you have designed us to love each other. Lord, that you would give us a heart for the lost, that even today we would shine brightly in this world that needs you so badly. We honor you, we glorify you. And if there's anyone here who does not know you, just open your heart to Jesus. Give your life to him. Respond to him. If there's anyone here today who has put anything before Jesus Christ, that you would return to that first love, that you would return to that place where he's Lord and Savior, which means he is master. He is number one. He is preeminent, as we learned. He is the priority of, in our lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time. We thank you for the goodness that you have. Thank you for opening this place again. We ask that you would have your hand upon all those who allow us to be here. It is a blessing to be able to gather together, worship you, and get into your word. We hold your, weird dear, your word dear to our hearts as we glorify you with our lives. We love you, Lord. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you guys stand? Let's go out of here singing to the Lord.